The Republic Assault Ship, sometimes informally the Jedi Troop Carrier, or the Transgalactic Cruiser, or more formally the Acclimator, classed as a Proto Star Destroyer. This is one of my favorite ship designs in Star Wars. Preeminently featured at the end of Attack of the Clones and seen throughout the Clone Wars and other media, it's really an interesting step in the first major military capital ship mass produced in millennia in the Star Wars galaxy. One problem, it's so very hard to find miniatures of it. And for a long time, this is the one I've shown you. This is from a game, tabletop game, and it's about the only way to get. But there is one other that was released over 20 years ago from the formerly Galoob, then Hasbro, Miracle Machines Action Fleet. This was labeled as the Republic Assault Ship. The Aquamander name wasn't really used back in uh, tw uh, 2002. And these are the only two I've ever been able to pick up. The only die cast, these are both plastic, polymer, the only die cast I've noticed are other unpainted game pieces as well that aren't super high detail. Why? Why has Diagostini, the Titanium series, the newer Altea series, even the original Micro Machine miniatures, why has no one done more of the Acclimator? It seems such an important ship, and we've done far, far more obscure ships. And it's not as if this design would even be hard to do. It's pretty straightforward. And it's also the first step in one of the most famous sci-fi ships of all time, the Star Destroyer. I, it's a question that keeps me up at night. It has done for years, and I've asked a lot of people that are more knowledgeable than myself, and I've never really had an answer. So if you have one, please let me know. And that was the intro. That was the preface. This is Misha. And, I don't know, kind of felt like deep diving talking about the Acclimator. Why not? And, if you'd like to see more of the original Action Fleet, well, it's cold right now, so I'm not going up in the attic. But I can actually drag down my original collection one day. Maybe we'll compare or contrast. I pretty much bought them all up through about the B-Wing. I never did get the E-Wing. I remember that. And I don't believe I ever got the TIE Defender, but I did get some other kind of weird and rare cool ones. Probably even a few I forgot because it's been 25 years. Anyway, back to the Acclimator, talking about its history, its place, and universe. But seriously, if anyone can tell me why so few miniatures have been made, either in plastic or die cast, please do let me know. There's got to be a reason. Is it licensing? I don't think so but maybe anyway let's go back to actually before the trade federation's blockade and eventual invasion of naboo and 32 bby before the battle of yavin let's first put the action fleet republic assault ship on this mini thing and yes this does predate the battle of Naboo, because the clones were actually just starting to be grown. Django Fett had already been selected around the same time, 32 BBY. Nominally, the whole thing was started by Jedi Master sifo but he was just a patsy, directly being manipulated by Lord Tyrannus, his former friend, but ultimately it was all done by Palps Sheev himself. And everything was in service to the clones, starting with Kamino. This would go out. They would make the clones. They would design their armor for them, originally the Phase 1. They would design weapons for them. These would be from Blastech. They will be the DC-15As originally, later the DC-15Ss. And moving up, we would have vehicles, walkers and whatnot, including the at T E, 
on the ground and then we would also have the the lot the L A A T gunships both the I the infantry variant and the larger C cargo variant interestingly at the very beginning they really didn't have a starfighter the goal was to simply get troops quickly across the galaxy on the planetary surfaces and moving up from there they would need a transport ship and one that was capable of traveling across the galaxy as a rapid response force and punching through a blockade doing a little bit of fighting but mostly delivering troops onto the surface of anything uh, be it solid marshy even water and that's where the genesis for this vessel is found with the earliest work going all the way back to 35 BBY and the first prototypes coming a few years later. The system we would come to know as the Acclimator was designed and produced by Rothana Heavy Engineering, which was essentially a subdivision, a company owned by Kuat Drive Yards. Kuat pretty much had been the producer of major ships in the galaxy for centuries, even millennia. But before the Clone Wars, there really had not been a galactic army in centuries, millennia, since the reformations and whatnot. Now, we did have planetary defense forces, and some of those were quite large and powerful, even having large, powerful capital ships. And these would be used during the Clone Wars. But the Grand Army of the Republic itself, the clones, and therefore their hardware, were special forces, essentially. Rapid response, if you will. And in the very beginning, when the war would kick off with the Battle of Geonosis and 22 BBY, this was their primary ship. And what a ship it was. It was... 752 meters long, 460 meters wide at its widest point, and between 183 and 200 meters tall, depending on the positioning of the landing gear, because it was definitely meant to not only fly into an atmosphere, but land and even kind of operate as a base on the surface of a planet, moon, what have you. So it was quite a massive ship, but again, not the largest in the galaxy. And it had a relatively reasonably small crew by both real world and even Star Wars standards of 700 officers and enlisted. But these were meant to be clones. Yes, natural humans from the Republic could serve on board, but usually did not you sometimes would just see Jedi generals and commanders. But no, clones would be the main servers. And it would all be done up here at the conning tower. This was a narrow structure. We had rather advanced sensor mapping systems located in the very front with a small row of actual windows. Behind that, in the main portion, we had the bridge itself. No windows there, but it did have virtual hollow screens, probably borrowed from Star Trek Discovery. It had the rather iconic triangular viewports and at least two crew pits to work in, plus a command walkway above. <clears throat> and behind that we had additional command facilities. Moving towards the rear, we have two main large sublight engines, two secondary engines, and eight tertiary thrust vectoring engines, really more for maneuverability. Again, this thing was to operate in an atmosphere, so it makes sense to have different scaling there. But really where this vessel was unique and advanced was in its faster-than-light capability. 
it was really the fastest ship in the galaxy, at least, that was mass-produced, capable of going across the galaxy in a very, very short period of time. Again, rapid response. In fact, it had a class 0 0.6 hyperdrive. For comparison, the Millennium Falcon post-solo modifications had a class 0 0.5. And most Star Destroyers later on in the Empire would have a Class 2. So quite a bit quicker. And it had a Class 10 backup. In fact, the main hyperdrive system was two cores linked together to give this. The downside was it was very energy hungry. But it would get there quickly. In fact, it could travel around the galaxy twice before it needed to refuel. And this rear fin, while it was there for maneuvering in an atmosphere to help with the vectoring, it actually did house the hyperdrive systems as well as radiation of heat. And it also contained the primary anti-grav systems. Not just important for flight in space, but also operations on a uh, planet because of the bulk of the vessel. Buried right in the middle, in the center of the ship, we had the reactor, the hyperdrive reactor. It was very efficient for what it was, but again, it was being drawn upon for power. And in front of it, still buried in the hull, but a little further forward, we had the matter reaction tanks. These are actually very dense material fed into the core. And uh, because it was so energy hungry, it could only last in space about six months before it needed refueling. Maybe even less if it was traveling a lot. From there, well, looking at the interior, we have roughly 17 decks, including two large, deep hangar decks at the bottom. At the top, though, the dorsal side, we had Mostly accommodations for the crew, conference rooms, mess halls, medical bays, that kind of thing. And as I mentioned, the crew was just 700. That seems rather few for such a large, bulky ship. But that's because this was meant as a transgalactic transport. And that's where we can really talk about what it did. And let's pop this off the stand. On the bottom, that's where everything happens. This could carry up to 16,000 personnel, including a full legion of clone troopers, 9,000, plus support and maintenance crews for the vehicles, up to 6,000 and then the crew on the ship, so nearly 16,000 in total. The clones would live rather compacted in barracks. <laughs> it's kind of what they were used to since their birth on Camino. And you would have a primary hangar here with these two hatches to deploy mostly vehicles, either in the air, the L L, I was the L A A T, or on the ground like the A T T E. They were quite large, enough that two L A A T I's could take off side by side, or one L A A T C could could launch from. And there was kind of a rotating spindle inside to efficiently launch these, also recover and repair them. There was also a secondary hangar or cargo bay here with a ramp, and that was primarily for the actual ground forces to debark. So there were three main areas for debarkation. Now I talked about the troops, this also carried vehicles for them, and uh, Quite a large number at that. These included up to 66 LAATI, the smaller gunships, 
up to 14 LAAT Cs, the cargo ships, 48 ATTE, tactical enforcers, 36 self-propelled artillery pieces, and up to 320 various speeder bikes like the Bark Speeder or later the 75Z, what have you, you know, small craft. It could also carry up to 10,000 tons of other just stuff. It was not designed, however, to carry starfighters because that wasn't its job. So you had the crews and all that and their equipment. And because it was such a fast vessel, these could be sent across. And the design was to, if they encounter resistance, to punch through a blockade and land on the surface. And that gets us to weapons on the vessel. These were not designed as warships primarily, but they were armed if needed. For example, they had 12 quad turbo laser emplacements, three on each side, plus a total of six facing the front. They also had 12 laser cannon batteries, again, reasonably well dispersed around, plus smaller, lower yield point defense lasers for well, kind of protecting against missiles and starfighters coming in. Speaking of missiles, they did actually have a decent loadout here, all located right at the front. They had four heavy torpedo tubes carrying 100 heavy proton torpedoes. They also carried a small complement of roughly 20 concussion missiles for anti-fighter purposes, but yeah, mainly just those missiles. For defense, they had very powerful regenerative shieldings with multiple generator points, but again, this consumed energy. And finally, they had a very sturdy neutronium reinforced hull, which was very efficient at dispersing energy shots. So even if it was hit through the shields, the hull was designed to take it, tank it, and uh, disperse it around the large surface. And this really made them quite durable. So they can come through, they have those for punching through a blockade, and then once they hit an atmosphere, they could deploy their three legs landing gear and land on really any surface. Sure, a solid surface was best, but they could hit unstable terrain, even landing on water. Not ideal, but it was in the design if necessary. And that's because they did not just rely on their physical legs for landing. They also had repulsor lifts, anti-grav systems built in to help counterbalance and keep everything stable. So if they were tilting, they could do that to keep them gone going and then deploy the ramps to let the troops out. Like so. That's kind of the neat thing about the action fleet. One is you can put your manger boarding ramps down and your legs down. I do wish that the third boarding ramp for the troops could come down, but then again, it would be tiny in this scale compared to the bigger ones. Again, these were dozens of meters across, so yeah. Should also mention that the acclimator, while it was fast at light speed, was no slouch at sublight, even in atmosphere, able to hit 1200 kph. Keep in mind that was as fast as a later TIE fighter and faster than a later X-Wing. So these could really, uh, really, really go fast and deliver a large number of troops with full support for them. They could e even operate as a command base when landed and they could fully deploy all their troops, all their walkers, all their gunships in just a few hours, which logistically is pretty impressive. And while these could operate solo, they were actually meant to operate in, uh, in groups and what have you. And in 22 BBY, when the Clone Wars kicked off with the Siege of the Jedi at Geonosis, several dozen of these had already been produced by Rathana Heavy Engineering. 
and a total of 16 were used at Geonosis. 12 would actually go to the surface, delivering a total of 192,000 troops and their vehicles. Three would remain in space to act as pickets and defend against the CIS fleet, and one would act as the central command ship flagship in orbit with another being on the ground, the one with uh, Master Yoda on board. And that was the beginning of the Clone Wars and the beginning of the Acclimator service. So now that we've talked about the engineering behind it, let's go into the history and also let's, let's now switch out the models or toys. I should point out that originally these just had a gray, more or less unpainted hull. But as the Clone Wars would go on, they would get the traditional Republic red stripes, one down the middle, some on the sides, first used for consular diplomatic vessels. And yeah, this one is smaller, it's a gaming piece, but it actually impresses me with the detail level for what it is. So at the first battle of Geonosis, 22 BBY, these would deliver their troops and vehicles, and then many would return to orbit to kind of engage the CIS fleet, and it was considered a successful operation. So only a handful were lost there. They are proven to be rather strong, and they took everything by surprise, at least most people, not Palps. And their second major engagement was the Battle of Christophus, where they would be a company, they'd, they'd send four acclimators, and they'd have escort by three of the new Venator, which is kind of the opposite of this vessel, whereas this was designed primarily as a troop transport, and would be a warship as a secondary role, something like a heavy cruiser. The Venator was designed as a starfighter carrier, and battleship as a secondary role. And they complemented each other very well, and essentially were from the same, same design bureaus anyway. These would also find uses as mobile depots, resupply ships, with lots of cargo areas. They would also be dedicated clone commando transports, and even more special special forces transports. And at the Battle of New Linz, it was even illustrated that these could be retrofit in the field to carry small starfighters. At that time it was the V-19 Torrent. They could carry over 150, but of course at the cost of their hangar bays. But if it was needed, it could do. But the Venator was, was better at that. Makes perfect sense. But it did show some flexibility, which is good as the Clone Wars drug on. The Acclimator did well, but even within the first year of the war, they started to show some shortcomings and weaknesses. For example, at the Battle of Ryloth, the Separatists discovered that they used proton cannons. They could fracture the armor of an acclimator. In fact, uh, Mace Windu's fleet of three was kind of held off. One was shot down, the other two retreated until the cannons could be destroyed on the surface, and then the other two would finally land. So the shielding and armor was good, but it was weak to more projectile and heavy energy weapons, rockets, that kind of thing, showing the need for fighter support, and more and more Venators would come online, thankfully. Kind of rounding out the first year of the war, we had the second Battle of Geonosis, an even larger engagement in a lot of ways, with ten Acclimators and six Venators, supported by other smaller ships and Starfighters coming in, to destroy a new droid factory before it would uh, be able to come online fully. And this would ultimately be successful, but would lead to a counter assault by the Separatists trying to destroy the cloning facilities at Kamino, which had kind of remained out of reach for a while beyond the Miju Rays. Uh, but the 501st with Jedi General Skywalker at the head would be sent on board the Acclimator to reinforce the bolster of the defenses at uh, Kamino, and they would tangle with uh, General Grievous there, 
in a blockade, but ultimately successful in defending the, the home planet of the clones and kind of wrapping up the first year of the war leading into 21 BBY. This was really the height of the Acclimator's popularity and service. As I said, a few dozen had been built before and right after the first battle of Geonosis, but the Republic was very impressed. Read Palpatine. He should have been. He basically built these. And so they ordered a thousand more. And uh, Ryloth, with uh, support from uh, KDF, would build these in pretty short order. These would all be Acclimator 1s or Mark 1s. The troop transport version we've talked about. And really the, the year 21 BBY would be capped off with the Battle of Sullust, in which Jedi General Skywalker's command ship, his Venator, was destroyed. But the Acclimators there supporting him would survive. Again, they were quick. They were one. 20 BBY would see more and more heavy use of the Venator, but the Acclimator would still be there, still doing its troop duties, and still being an important part of the Grand Army of the Republic. For example, at the Battle of Umbara, Three were sent and were very important. Embora had been part of the Republic, but after its senator died, it declared independence, joining the CIS, and uh, the Republic didn't want this, so they sent a fleet, and while there was heavy resistance, one acclimator punched through the blockade and was able to deliver its thousands of troops onto the surface, proving its utility once again. Later in the year, one of these would be sent, complete with ATTE support and troops, to defend Chancellor Palpatine during a holiday visit to Naboo. It's a thing. Check out the Clone Wars. There was an acclimator there. Kind of cool. By 19 BBY, though, the war was shifting. We would go soon to the outer region's sieges and the immediacy and the eating troops on the ground would be uh, lessening. So the Acclimator's role would be diminishing. For example, with the Battle of Ringovinda, while we had two dozen capital ships, including mostly Venators and heavy cruisers, there was only one or two Acclimators there. They just really weren't needed, and they were mostly being used as mobile supply ships and uh, depots then. But they were still there. They would also be used at... Battle of Mon Calamara, Mon Calamari, where they illustrated their ability to land and operate on water, on an ocean. Kind of cool. And in the last year of the Clone Wars, a second variant would be introduced. We've talked about the Acclimator 1 so far. There would also be the Acclimator 2. Essentially, the hull was the same, but its internal flexibility was utilized to turn it into more of a bombardment ship. It had heavy bombardment laser cannons and other weapons to attack a planetary surface. Also, it could operate as a frigate or cruiser in space battles. So, more weapons, more abilities to fight, but this would lessen its troop carriage abilities and ability to carry heavy equipment like walkers. Again, different variants. And they wouldn't actually build that many Acclimator 2s with production really just for about a year. At this point, the Venator was what was really being used in the Clone Wars were wrapping up. Essentially, it was mopping up operations. So what about in the Imperial era? You know, I have to admit, for an inexpensive gaming miniature, this has a lot of nice little detail. Also, Action Fleet. I like this one, I really do. I've seen some people say that the new Micro Galaxy series from Jazzwares is light, whereas the old Galoobs were heavier duty. Have you picked up a Micro Machines lately? Not that they're bad, but they're pretty light too, guys. Just thought I'd mention that. Neither the Venator or the Acclimator really fit into the New Empire's naval scheme. 
But the Venator would continue on until being replaced by the Imperial class Star Destroyer. The Acclimator, though, first production was halted officially by 18 BBY, and it was never officially part of the Navy, part of the main star fleet. But they still had hundreds, if not thousands, of these, and at the end of the day, it was still a good ship. So, it would be repurposed. The Acclimator 2s were a little more keeping with what the Empire wanted, and uh, the Acclimator 1s would often be turned into cargo ships, repair ships, kind of just spacefaring bulk freighters. They would also sometimes be stationed in planetary defense forces, especially in outlying regions, kind of out of the way places. But they weren't really up for what they needed. So it wouldn't be long before many were scrapped or otherwise retired. Those that would survive into the Imperial era would be turned into prisoner transports, even slave barges. Although a few would still be kept as combat vehicles, fighting pirates, early rebellions, skirmishes, that kind of thing. But again, this was not primarily a warship, especially the Acclimator 1. So, yeah. They didn't really have a need to deliver a bunch of troops. Clones were out. Stormtroopers were in. ATTEs were being phased out in favor of newer walkers that these weren't really configured for. So the days are numbered. That said, there were still a few in active service before and right after the Death Star, so 0 BB slash ABY, and a couple operating as late as the Battle of Hoth Echo Base we're talking very much outlying regions and kind of being repurposed and and whatnot even a few rebels and pirates got their hands on these valuing them for their flexibility however their high cost of fuel and lack of offensive weaponry and outdated shielding would play a role again though very very quick hyperdrive so there's still something to be said for that but by the time of indoor for ABY this was pretty much a relic of the past even though it had actually been declared obsolete 15 years earlier but that is the story of the acclimator the Republic assault ship the transgalactic troop carrier so what do you think? When uh, episode 2 came out, a friend of mine described this to me as, yeah, a proto-Star Destroyer, and that's clearly the lineage going from this to the Venator. In-universe, it said that this directly inspired the Victory class, whereas the Venator inspired the Imperial. And it did appear, appear in a few video games, especially like Empire War, before episode 3 came out, and before the Venator kind of took everything by the storm. And as I've introduced the video, if you know why so few companies have done miniatures of the Acclimator, do please let me know, because it's one of those questions that just kind of bugs me. Maybe it just kind of got left behind. It's just kind of an odd oversight. I was hoping the new Altea line would do one, but so far, at least as of recording this video, they haven't. And the micro galaxies really shouldn't because this is too large for that scale. Even though, yeah, the action fleet did it. But they did this back when they weren't doing figures anymore, so it's a little more. Uh, it's a nice one here. I'd, I'd like that the hatches come down in the front gear. I wish they could have found a way to make the rear gear not just rotate, but actually fold up into the hull. But I think logistically that would have been rather hard to do. So I understand. Maybe it would have been nice if they made them where you could just unplug them. 
At least these did come with nice stands. But yeah, I just felt like revisiting it on this cold winter's weekend. So let me know what you think. As always, if you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time. Let's begin with the action fleet on the spinny thing. And yeah, this does pre-bay.